All right, we can get started. Um, so uh, I'm going to pass around now uh, the sample final exam. There'll be two versions of it. The ones with the solutions and ones without the solutions. So like if you wanted to practice uh, and, and here, if you want to practice and like with, you know, without seeing the answer to do it, you take both copies. You, you want one, ones with solutions, one without. So in this, the practice exam I'm giving you guys is just two questions. Um, it's sort of showing you at a high level what the final exam will essentially look like. And as you can see, it's not something like where true and false questions or multiple choice questions based on a particular lecture or a particular reading. The idea here is that you want to synthesize the various topics and, and things that we talked about through that the entire semester and be able to answer new questions or come up, you know, apply the knowledge to, to new problems. Um, so in the practice one I gave you, it's two questions on the real final exam. It'll be four questions and you'll roughly have a, uh, an hour and 20 minutes to complete it. So the idea is roughly about 15 minutes per question. Okay? Again, that'll be on Thursday in class uh, ne next week. All right, the other administrative stuff we have are uh, the code review, we do, the second round of the code review will be due uh, next, next, next Thursday as well, at night, at midnight. And the idea here is that I decided that we'll just keep the same groups for everyone from the first code review, and that keeps it, uh, make sure, you, you know, you, that way you're not reading a whole bunch of new code that you didn't understand, uh, that you have to understand all over again. Um, and then, the, again, the final presentations will be somewhere in Wien Hall on the 9th at 5.30 p.m. And it'll be the same sort of setup as we had for the proposals and the project updates. You'll come present on, on stage uh, the, you know, the final outcome of, of, of your project. And there'll be, there'll be pizza and t-shirts and prizes for everyone. Okay? So any questions about the final exam? Any questions about what's expected for the, uh, the final presentation of the code review? So if you want to make this cleaner, what we can do for the code review, we can just... Uh, we can close your previous uh, pull request on GitHub and you can submit a new one. And that way, we you know, it's not all dirtied up with the, the previous review. Right? And, and it's, it's more obvious what people should be looking at. It's up to you to guys to decide what you want to do. Okay? All right, so for today's class, uh, the, in the final lecture, we're going to be looking at what's called non-volatile memory. And so unlike all of the... Uh, the lectures that we've done so far in this class, this one is actually looking at hardware that doesn't quite actually exist yet, or at least doesn't exist in, in, you know, to, to us in the general public where we can buy it and use it. So everything else has been assumed that the, the hardware we have is actually something you can use. This is, this is looking at more, uh, more future-looking uh, devices. So we'll start off some background about what non-volatile memory storage looks like. And then we'll cover the paper you guys read that we wrote here at CMU, where we evaluated the different sort of design decisions or architectures you can have for your database system to see how they perform on, on, on non-volatile memory. All right, so the, the term non-volatile memory is, 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 can mean different things for different people. Um, Technically, you know, NAND flash is like a type of non-volatile memory, but when I really sort of say non-volatile memory, I, I really mean something where you have this storage device or the storage technology that it's going to be able to have the same speed or almost the same speed you can get for reads and writes as DRAM, but it's going to be completely persistent and durable like an SSD. So sometimes in the literature you'll see these things called storage class memory or persistent memory or NVRAM. Uh, for our purposes, we'll just say NVM is this, this, this special device that has this unique property where it's like DRAM, but it's completely, completely durable. So the first devices that will come out are actually, are out actually now. Intel announced that they came out, uh, I think it was last month or so. The first devices will be completely block addressable, meaning just, it's going to look like a NAND flash card that sits on the PCI Express bus, uh, and you can read and write to it in, in, in terms of blocks. And the protocol that you use for this the, is, a, is a newer, uh, newer uh, technology called NVMe. 
And again, now you start to see why these, this term MVM is overloaded and I've used it in a lot of different things, right? So you can have, you can use the MVME protocol for NAND flash, but that's not what I'm describing up here when I say MVM, right? So as we see as we go along, the, these block addressable devices aren't going to be that interesting for us from a database perspective because it's just going to look like a faster, better version of what the NAND flash technology we have today. It's the later devices, and I'll sort of give you a prediction when I think they're going to come out, uh, that are actually going to be byte addressable. And that's going to be the real game changer for how we design our database systems. So what I mean by byte addressable, think of like, again, like we can access a single pointer tuple to get, single pointer to get to a tuple, and we can do our read, read or writes for, at, sort of at the byte level. And then as we see as we go along, it, it is my conjecture that you have to, you're going to have to redesign your database system architecture to be able to use this, uh, use this technology correctly. But we'll, we'll go along. So, to understand now uh, the sort of the background of how we got to the point where we are today, where we have this non-volatile memory, I actually think it's a really, really interesting story uh, to sort of go through how people sort of discovered uh, sort of the modern incarnation of non-volatile memory, how they sort of came about figuring out what, you know, that we can actually manufacture these things. So I'm not a electrical engineer, I've never taken an electrical engineering course, but the the, the, the general understanding of how we understand circuits for, for you know, almost 200 years is, or passive circuits is through these sort of three fundamental uh, primitives or fundamental elements of, of circuit design. So the first one you can have is the capacitor, all right? And this is essentially a battery, like you can store some charge in it, right? And this was first discovered, I think, in England in 1745. And this is sort of the first passive circuit that they, that they, that they helped, uh, or they, they, that they invented. Then a little bit later, they came along with the resistor. And the idea here, it's a two terminal device where you, you put in some charge and then based on the property of the resistor, you can, uh, you can modify what the voltage is gonna be coming out on the, on the other end. And then a few years later, they came out with the inductor in 1831. Uh, I think of this as just like a heating coil. You put a charge in and then these coils, you know, converts the, uh, the, the voltage into heat. So, if you take a, uh, you know, if you, if you take a, an, an ECE course, they'll basically describe these, these three fundamental elements to you as, as the sort of basic building blocks for all circuits. So what is really interesting about this, though, is that in 1971, there was this new professor at Berkeley called, uh, named Leon Chua. And he worked out the math that there had to be actually a fourth element, that the three elements that I just showed you the capacitor, the inductor, and the resistor were not enough. There was, in order to get the equations to balance correctly, there had to be this other fourth element. Um, and the, the, the distinctive property about this fourth uh, fundamental element is that its resistance on the, on, the, on the circuit could change based on how you apply the voltage to it. And then what would happen is, even if you then stop applying the voltage to it, it would, it would still remember what the what the resistance was. And he claimed that this was a, had to be a fourth fundamental element because you, you could not build this, this type of circuit or element using the other three primitives. So it had to be the, its own fundamental element in its own right. So he published this paper uh, and in 1971 and no one read it. Right? No, no one learned it. No one, it, was, it was very esoteric. It was very mathematical. And it was just sort of like no, no, one, no one thought of it. Um, and so what he was actually ended up proposing was what we call now the memristor. Uh, and again, the basic idea of the memristor is that it, it's going to, uh, it's like a resistor, but you can change what its resistance is by changing a voltage to it. And then when you take with that voltage away, it maintains or remembers that resistance. And that's obviously going to sound like something we can use later on to store ones and zeros. And that's how we're going to build non-volatile memory. So the Chua's paper came out in 1971. And as I said, no one read it. Um, flash forward now to the early 2000s. There was a team at HP Labs in California led by uh, this researcher named Stanley Williams. Um, and they were, he was leading a team where they were trying to uh, develop sort of these new nano devices to build like sort of self-assembling uh, circuits. 
And what they found was that they, they kept seeing this weird property in the devices that they were they're generating in their lab, and they didn't actually understand what, what was going on. It had this weird property where that, again, if you put a charge into it, it would remember its resistance, and you take the charge away, and it would still be there. And so they kind of like went on for this for a couple years, not realizing what they actually had. And by pure accident, pure luck, they end up stumbling upon uh, Leon Chua's 1971 paper about the memristor and realized what they actually end up ha had, had, had invented, right? Because they were then, again, for, for years they were trying to figure out why, why do, do, do these circuits that they developed, these nanocircuits, why do they have the properties that they were having? And so there's a really great paper that came out in 2008 called How We Found the Missing Memristor that sort of talks about how, you know, from, from Stanley Williams, how they sort of stumbled upon this. And if you're interested in learning more about Stanley Williams, when you Google him, uh, you're going to come across two people. And so when we first started this project, I had Joy sort of reach out to Stanley Williams and, and try to contact him and to talk to him. And Joy uh, inadvertently contacted this guy. This is Stanley Williams, who's actually on death row in California for founding the West Side Crips. Right? This is not the Stanley Williams that invented the Memristor. It's this other guy here. And there's a great talk from him in 2008, again, where he, at, when he was at UCLA, that talks about, again, how they sort of discovered this, and it's sort of laid out in this, in this paper here. So if you Google for Stanley Williams, you want this one, not this one. And actually, he might actually be dead now, too. All right, so what was, so what was the unique property they were, they were found in when they were building these circuits uh, was, was, could be uh, graphed in sort of this loop, loop here. So this is called a hysteresis loop. And the idea here is along the current, along the voltage, as you change the voltage, it modifies the current. And you would have this sort of, sort of loop, right? And it's a sort of weird property because not the other uh, fundamental elements of the circuits don't, don't exhibit this, this behavior. So what was really kind of cool now is then they went back after they figured out, oh, we have actually have a memristor. And this, this, is, this is sort of the, the telltale characteristic of what you see when you actually run the circuit. They actually went back now into all the old publications and annals of sort of scientific journals from the last like 200 years. And what they found was that people kept coming across this sort of property and showing graphs that look a lot like this, but not real, realizing what they actually had invented. So there's another great paper called The Two Centuries of Memristors that was published in Nature, where they, they look back and get all these old papers and they see people drawing the sort of same thing. So this is a paper from 1948 about people doing experiments in, with vacuum tubes. Um, and again, you see, you see more or less the same hysteresis loop. And you read these papers and they essentially say like, we see this property, we don't know, what it, we don't know why it's doing it, we just think it's kind of interesting, so here, here it is. Right? And it, it, I think this one's from 1948, there's other ones that go back to like the 1920s and early days of circuits and things like that. Where again, people are essentially inventing memristors without realizing what, the, what they actually had. So, now we can go through and talk about what the actual technologies uh, that the main way we're actually going to manufacture these, these, uh, these non-volatile memory devices. And so what I'll say up front also too is what's kind of confusing about this, this terminology as well is that when HP invented their, their memristor device, their non-volatile memory device, they called it the memristor. The name of the fundamental element circuit is the memristor, but HP sort of marketing the thing as a memristor. But all of these devices here, that are technologies I'm going to tell you about, these are technically classified as memristors. But HP calls their thing a memristor, and no, nobody else does. But at, at, basically, they're, they're the same thing. So we'll go through phase change memory, resistive RAM, which would be what HP markets as the memristor, and then the spintronics or mag magnetic res resistive RAM. And the idea here is, again, not so much necessarily to understand uh, at a real detailed level how this, these, these, these storage mediums are actually manufactured and how they, how they actually work at a really low level, just give you a high level idea about how they actually work. And then we can talk a little bit about what the implications are for when you actually build a, a, a real computer, a real you know, database server, how these things can actually fit, fit into the, the hierarchy. So the, the, for the longest time, it seemed that the most, the most promising technology for non-volatile memory was this thing called phase change memory. And the basic idea how this works is that uh, you have this sort of special material here, the calcinogenide, and Think of it as sort of like a, as like a little crystal. I mean, it's an oversimplification, but the basic idea is the same. 
And what happens is that when you sort of heat up this special material, it becomes uh, like opaque. And that changes the resistance of the current that you run through it. So think of it like it's a little, uh, little uh, line going into it, and then if you want to you know, make it a one, you, you send a big charge through it and it becomes opaque. Or if you do a slower uh, voltage into it, then it becomes clear, and that represents the zero. Right, sort of like, again, it has a little heater, that it's not obviously a, a, you know, a little lighter, but like you heat it up a little bit and it changes it, its property. So for the longest time, this seemed like this was going to be the most promising technology. And actually, uh, I think maybe like five or six years ago, you could actually could buy phase change memory in a very limited uh, uh, amount. Like you, you could buy a little, um, you know, something you maybe want to embed in like a cell phone or something like that. You could buy like 128 megabytes of it, right? The reason why this never actually really took off uh, is because because of having to send this, 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 this current into it. And that actually generates heat. So now if you want to have a lot of these things maybe stacked together, it's going to generate a lot of heat. And, and that sort of limits what you would actually do with it. We won't talk about this much so much uh, in this class, but like later on in, when, they actually, when the new designs of CPUs are coming out, they're talking about doing 3D stacking of actual memory on top of the CPU itself. And if you're using something that generates heat, like DRAM or... Uh, phase change memory, then you're not going to be able to do that. Whereas in the mem memristor ones we'll see in a second, you, you can do this. So for the longest time, this seemed like this, we, this is the first technology act, uh, that I was going to come out. It seemed like IBM was talking up about how they had phase change memory. I think, um, I think uh, Intel for the longest time talked about how they wouldn't have phase change memory. Um, but it doesn't seem like the, the first MVM stuff that's coming out uses this, this thing at all. All right, so now the, uh, the, what I actually think is the, was going to be the, the, the prominent storage medium going forward for MVM is what's called resistive RAM. And what I'm describing here is actually what uh, Hewlett Packard put out, the HP, when they, when they announced the memristor. This, I'm going to describe how, what, how their device actually works. Intel has their new 3D cross point that actually is on the market today. Um, and they market this as resistive RAM. I don't know how it actually works, so they've been, they haven't really disclosed anything. Um, I think it works essentially the same way because they talk about it being you know, 3D cross point, which sort of the, the terminology matches up sort of the crossbar technology that HP put out in their memristors. But obviously it's going to be different because they want to avoid all the patent mess that HP has for memristors. So the way the Hewlett Packard one works is actually really kind of cool. So you have like two layers of, of platinum. And this is obviously done at a really small nanoscale. And then you have uh, two layers of uh, titanium dioxide. And in one, the top layer, it's going to have uh, missing electrons. And the bottom layer is going to have uh, all the electrons. And the idea is that as you put a, a voltage through this, electrons move up and down. And then that ends up changing the resistance of this particular circuit. So then now you can do, you can measure 0 and 1. Um, the cool thing about uh, memristors, and I guess full disclosure, like when, when, when Stanley Williams announced that, oh, we, have, we invented the memristor, it's going to come out, I totally drank the Kool-Aid because I was like, oh, this is awesome. This, this is totally going to be for real for now. The problem with HP is they always announce that it's always going to be two years later, right? So they, they're like, 2008, they announced they found it, and they're like, oh, yeah, we'll be, we'll be selling this in two years. And then 2010 came along, and it was like two more years. And it keeps going on for it, and it never actually comes out. But what's really kind of fascinating about the memristor stuff is that this titanium dioxide is like super cheap and super common. Like titanium dioxide is the same thing they use in white house paint, and it's the same material they use in like sunscreen. So it's 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 very you know it's it's, it's not like a like a rare earth metal that's hard to find. There's tons of it. The problem is though manufacturing this at the, at the min nanoscale to have the property that you want at the the density you want is I think sort of what they've been struggling with. Another re really interesting thing about uh, the memristor, which again we won't, mention, we won't talk about in this class, is that they claim that you can actually turn the, the storage lot or storage uh, material, like the actual the cells that are storing the zeros and ones, you actually can turn them into executable logic gates. So you can sort of think of this like, a, like almost like an FPGA, where you have your memristor device and you can turn ha one half of it to actually be storage and the other half can be like 
uh, executable gates that can actually run, run programs, or, you know, compile queries, or do store procedures. Um, and what's really kind of cool about this is that, unlike sort of the CMOS circuits that we have now, uh, this memristor, the way that the, these logic gates work, is actually based on another type of logic called material implication that was invented by this famous philosopher and mathematician from England named Bertrand Russell from like the 1920s. So this is crazy when you think about it. Like the, we're talking about like 21st century technology using like 1920s math and theory to actually execute things. And they talked about in these, in these papers that came out about memristors, they were talking about how like, oh, we'll, we'll be able to turn these executable logic gates into neural networks and we'll be able to build completely on memristors models of the human brain. Like this is sort of touted as how we're gonna get you know, artificial intelligence. Uh, true artificial intelligence, and it never panned out. Like you don't, HP kind of dropped the ball on this. So I don't know what's going on, um, but they keep putting this out for for and for farther and farther in the future, and it never looks like it's going to actually become available. Um, and this is actually a, a screenshot from their uh, one of their HP labs, one of their um, you know product conventions or, or, or uh, showcases at in 2010. As you can see here. Right, 2006, they found HP proves the fourth fundamental element circuit, uh, circuitry. 2008, they claimed they're development ready, right? And then, then it, two, years late, two years later, it was 2010, oh, we're still two years away, two years away, two years, two years away. And then, I think it was 2014, they announced the, the, their sort of moonshot idea that, for H, that was gonna save HP, was gonna build this new type of computer called the machine which is a terrible name, and I realize this is on video, but <laughs> I, I'll fully admit this. It's, it's like, I'm not, I'm not ashamed claiming naming your computer the machine is terrible. And so one of the things that, that was going to be in the, in the machine that made it different than anything ever else that was ever invented was that it was going to have memristors. Um, and I think last year, I think the, mem the machine is still supposedly on the way on coming out, but they no longer claim it's going to have memristors. It's just going to have a lot of CPU cores. Right, and some kind of fast fabric to, to communicate things with a certain and flash or DRAM. So I love the idea of the memristor, but like they haven't stepped up to the plate and actually put anything out. So it is what it is. All right, the last sort of technology that I think uh, is actually kind of cool, but is going to be much, much farther away, is called magnetic uh, resistive RAM. And these are sort of more commonly called spintronics. Um, so the idea here is that you're going to have two sort of magnetic storage elements that we can use to measure the polarity and decide whether you have a zero or one. So the idea is that uh, sort of at the top layer you have, uh, you have a, a magnet that's fixed in one polarity and at the bottom layer you can flip it based to, be, you know, to go one direction or the other based on what charge you put into it. And then you can measure that to be zero or one. Um, I think Samsung is one of the early, uh, one of the people that actually were working in this area and maybe some of, some of the other uh, sort of uh, manufacturers. But this is much, much farther away. But actually, this is really cool. I think this is better than the, the 3D cross point or the mem memristors because you can get to much, much sm smaller scales than you can with those other devices or other storage mediums. Um, and it's supposed to be really, really fast. Uh, like almost to the speed of like your L1, L2 cache. Whereas the, the resistive RAM is probably going to be four to eight x slower than, than DRAM, which is still really, really fast, but not as fast as what Spintronics supposedly can do. Does that sound about right, Tony? Okay, he can't, he can't say anything. Okay, all right. All right, so now, given that I just told you that HP keeps claiming it's gonna come out and it never does, right? And we've been thinking about non-volatile memory for a long, long time, right? There's some early papers from, from the 1980s in databases where they talk about having battery backed up DRAM, um, but that never really, really, really went anywhere. And the reason why I would argue that this is actually happening for real this time, like real, real, not like fake real, is there's been three major changes in sort of the, the, the landscape in computer science and databases, or not, not necessarily databases, but in just computer science and, and operating systems that are actually going to make this, I think this is happening now. So, the first is that the industry has put together the, have, have agreed now the sort of come up with the standard terminologies and the form factors and, and the expectations and the protocols 
for these non-volatile memory devices. So before, you know, a bunch of one-off companies have made their own thing, now there's an industry consortium that says this is what the standard will be. The other big thing was, so that happened uh, last year and there's a newer update coming uh, in 2018 for the, the NVDIM uh, that goes in the DIM slot with persistent memory that I'll talk about in a second. The other big change was earlier this year, actually last year, was both Linux and Microsoft added support for non-volatile memory in their kernels. Right? And it goes under this code name of DAX or direct access. Right? And the idea here is now you're going to have actually support in your operating system to say, yes, here is actually truly persistent memory. Because up until now, we've been assuming we're under the von Neumann model, where you have volatile DRAM and, and persistent uh, storage, whether it's a spinning disk hard drive or an SSD. And now we actually have in, in the operating system a notion that, oh yes, there is actually byte addressable memory and actually it, it can be persistent. This doesn't necessarily mean that with this new, this, this sort of new kernel bypass method that if you pull the plug on your computer and then plug it back in, you're magically all going to come back just as you were before. Because obviously there's things that are still going to be volatile, like all your registers and your SRAM, your program counters. So, but this is now going to allow you to write applications that know that it's writing to these NVDIMs or this non-volatile memory directly. And then the last one is that Intel added in uh, 2017 for the, the, the Xeon ISA, they've actually added new instructions to now do cache line flushes directly to NVM. Because as we see, as we, as we walk through actually how you use this in a database system, the big problem with if, if you just had NVM and not had the CPU or the operating system be aware that it's actually persistent, then you would do write to cache lines and you would have no guarantee that it's actually been written out to NVM because the, the CPU can decide how it moves things up and down the hierarchy. So now there's these new instructions, the CL flush and CLWB, that can now say, yes, block my process, block, block my thread until this cache line has been safely written out to, to NVM. So you can't obviously build a database system using NVM without, without this, or actually all of these things. So this is why I think this is happening for real now. So to understand what this, the sort of the, the, the consortium has agreed upon for what these non volatile memory devices will look like, Again, think of now, like, not in the new Intel device where it's sitting on the PCI Express bus. Think of now something that's going to go into the, the DRAM slot, the DIM slot on your, on your motherboard. That's what we're talking about with, with this, this new MV, MV DIM stuff. So they've announced that there's basically uh, three types. Um, so you have MD, MV DIM F, and this is where you have basically a, it looks like DRAM, but it actually just has a NAND flash, right? And obviously you still need to have another, another DIM slot have actually real DRAM because this would be too slow to use for your, um, for, you know, for, for your, in your operating system. The next technology is MVDIM, MVDIM N, and this is where you have Flash and DRAM together actually on the same sort of, um, on the same DIM. Um, and it's gonna appear to the operating system as being volatile memory but it's, sort of, it's going to have a larger capacity than you would, you would normally have with a regular DRAM. So think about it, if you have so one gig, if you have this single DIM, it has one gigabyte of DRAM, but then 10 gigabytes of flash, it'll appear as 10 gigabytes uh, to, 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 the, uh, to the operating system. And then the last one is the, again, what I think is the big game changer, which is NVDIM P, and this is where you're going to have truly persistent memory using one of the, the three technologies that I just talked about before. There's going to be no DRAM or flash whatsoever on, on this actual device. Um, and the idea here is that you would use this in conjunction with the new kernel uh, support that I talked about before with DAX that you can read and write to these things and have it be persistent and the operating system can help you know where, where to get the data you're looking for when you restart, restart the server. So these are out uh, available today. This is, this is the, the, the major one that I think uh, will, will be a big game changer for us going forward. All right, so now, since we're taking a database class, what, how do we actually use this, right? W what do we have to change? And as I said in the beginning, if it's block addressable, it's not that interesting to us. It's just going to appear to us as a flash, a fast SSD, like a, the Fusion IO card that we saw in the, uh, in the Silo R paper, or some of the, you know, the newer high-end uh, flash devices you can get from Samsung and other people, right? In that case, we, there, we don't think there's actually going to be any, any major difference. But now if things are byte addressable, 
then it, it, it'll, we'll be able to get better performance than we could otherwise, but it's going to require some work on our end as database developers, as people actually building the, the, the internals of the database system, is going to require us to do some extra work to make, make sure we use these things correctly. And it is my belief that when these MVDMP devices actually come out, the in-memory database systems that we have today are actually going to be uh, better suited to actually com be converted over to use non-volatile memory than sort of the traditional disk-oriented block-based you know, block systems, like the Oracles and Postgres and MySQLs of the world. And the reason is because these guys already have this huge buffer pool right, that they have to maintain and all this other architecture comp architectural components to deal with the distinction between non-volatile DRAM and, vo and sort of volatile DRAM and, and non-volatile SSDs or spinning disk hard drives. Whereas the in-memory guys are already, you know, assuming the architecture of the system can have pointers directly to tuples and access them directly. And so it's just a little bit more extra work to now convert them over to make them use to recognize that they're doing reads and writes to, to non-volatile memory that's actually persistent. I can't prove this, but uh, in talking with people in industry, I'm, I'm getting the sense of like, there's people, there's companies that are actually looking at building new engines that will, you know, that replace the old disk architecture that they have to use an in-memory architecture that can then be converted over to use MVM. I can't say names because they're on, they're on video, but not hard to think about which ones we're talking about, right? So, I think this is true, but it's, it's a sort of, you know, we can't, can't prove this because it's a software engineering uh, comment. All right, so the, now the paper you guys read was our sort of first foray into exploring non-volatile non memory database systems here at CMU, where we were looking sort of well far into the future and saying, how would you actually want to design a database system when you only have non-volatile memory. And this is sort of my way as a new professor, like in my first one or two years here at CMU, I was like, all right, I can look 10 years in the future, right? What, what, should, it, what should a 10 year, 10 year future you know, system look like? And we said that, oh, DRAM is gonna go away, which I actually don't think is true anymore, but uh, at the time I thought this was true. Um, so we said, well, how would you actually build a database system where you assume that all memory is non-volatile uh, and, and byte addressable and persistent how would you actually want to design your database system? And so for this, we built a sort of separate uh, prototype called NStore. And then NStore essentially what, what, what got sort of rolled into and became, became Peloton. Um, but this was sort of our, our early prototype. And the idea that we were going to do, we, we were going to take sort of the standard textbook definitions or of, of, of database system architectures and l run them on non volatile memory and see where, you know, what are the parts that actually are, are suboptimal? And then come back and say, well, how can we tweak them? How can we change these architectures to use non volatile memory correctly? Not only to get better performance, but also to reduce the wear down on the device. So, there's another thing I, I, I didn't really talk about, but it's expected that these non volatile memory devices are not going to be infinitely writable, sort of like how SRAM and DRAM are. It's not going to be as bad as an SSD where if you write to the cell too many times, it, it, gets, it gets burnt out and you can't write to it anymore. Um, NVM is supposedly going to be a little bit more durable, but we're still going to have the same problem where we could burn out the device if we, if we use it too fast. Right? And this is a big problem now. If we want to do byte addressable loads and stores to, to you know, single cache lines, if we're not careful about how we design our, our database system, we could burn out a single cell in, you know, fa fairly quickly. So the things we now need to talk about is how we're actually going to, um, what are the building blocks we're going to need before we even get to actually designing our database system? What are the things we're going to need in, at, our, at our operating system, at a sort of a system level, in order for the database system to use non-volatile memory and have it be persistent and durable? So at the time, one of the big problems that we were facing is that all the existing programming models that were out there, this is before the, the, the Linux and, and, and uh, Microsoft added the, the DAX or to their kernel. At the time, all of this sort of the, the programming infrastructure that was available for us on, on a system assumed that all your writes to memory were, were volatile. And then we had another problem where that we, we the CPU was going to decide when actually it was going to move data from our uh, L1, L2, L3 caches out to, our, to DRAM. And that's bad because if we want to do a write 
and treat that as like a log or make sure that it's actually durable, we don't want to roll the dice and say, yeah, it'll eventually make the MVM, but we can we could crash and lose stuff. So we needed a way to ensure that if we write anything to our CPU caches, that we could then be guaranteed that it, was, it made it out to MVM before we sent back an acknowledgement that, that a transaction actually committed. And so to do this, sort of think, think of it like this, right? I do my, here's my data system, I do a load, or sorry, I do a store, and write something to my CPU cache, and then I want to make sure that it makes it out to MVM. And so to do this, this is where the, the, the additional, the new instructions that Intel put out solve this problem, because you can then do a cache line flush that says block my process until I know that the data has made it out, out here. All right, so that's sort of the first thing we had to deal with, with, with in synchronization. The second thing we had to deal with is that if our data system crashes, um, we want to be able to come back and make sure that all our pointers in our various data structures are now pointing to uh, valid locations or the same data that they were in before. So we're not going to be able to recover again program counters and low-level registers. This is strictly having to do with all the, the high-level data structures that we're going to build in our database system. We want to make sure that they're all going to be persistent. So to sort of think of it like this, say we have our, our index and it's going to be using, it has these pointers to stuff in our table heap and this is all going to sit now on MVM, right? And then now internally in our table heap, we can also have pointers to other versions of the same tuple, right? Because that's going to be, say we're doing MVCC and we need to have a, we need to have a version chain. But now if we crash and come back, we, need, we want to be able to come back and see the exact same uh, state as we were before. Even though, again, the, you know, it's the physical uh, location of this, of this data may move in memory. We want all our virtual pointers, or, or pointers to, vir to virtual memory to still be persistent. So we essentially had to rewrite our own memory allocator that would, could guarantee this, 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 this for us. And essentially what happened to be in the same way that you flush the actual data out to MVM to make sure it's persistent, you can flush the allocated pages of your allocator out to MVM and make sure they're persistent. And then on top of that, then you can build these, you assume you have these non-volatile memory pointers that can guarantee that you're always gonna have consistent data after you restart. So at the time, we actually had to build our own memory allocator because it didn't exist. Uh, now, uh, Intel has a library called pmem.io that provides this, this functionality for you. Oracle has their own thing. I think Microsoft has another one. But the basic idea is that they're providing you this guarantee that your pointers will be consistent even though your, 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 your system can, can restart. Right? right? And so again, this is essentially what I just said. So we built our own MVM-aware memory allocator. And the way we got synchronization is that we rely on the, the CL flush. Uh, to flush out ca the cache line, and then we would issue an S-Sense instruction to make sure that uh, we'd wait to, make, to know that our data was actually durable. And then for the uh, ensuring that we have consistent data at the restarts, we, have an al we wrote our own allocator that could then ensure that all the memory, virtual memory addresses that were assigned to some memory map region for our process will be the same no matter how many times the operating system or the data system restarts. And again, you don't get the program counters, you don't get registers, it's just the you know, think of this as you get malloc, a bunch of data, and you can have pointers inside of that, and if you restart your process, everything is still uh, pointing to, to the correct location. All right, so now we, from this, using this as a building block, now we can, uh, we can then say how do we actually want to design our different database system architectures. So the sort of three standard architectures you can have are doing in-place updates, copy and write, and log structured. So the in-place updates is, this is sort of, again, the standard architecture we, we talk about in the in introduction class. Uh, and this is basically where you have a table heap and you, you write to tuples uh, and you overwrite the old value with the new value and you maintain a write-ahead log and a snapshot on, on disk or a non-volatile memory that says, here's all the changes that I made and here's the consistent checkpoints of, of my database over time. And this is, this is the same architecture that's used in BoltDB and HStorm. The other next architecture you can have is to do copy on write. And this is essentially the shadow paging approach that we talk about in the intro class or that, that IBM first developed in System R in the 1970s. And here it's basically can be organized as a tree structure and we'll make a shadow copy of pages in the table whenever they're updated. And we only flip pointers when we know that our transactions had committed. For this one, you don't need to write head log at all because the master version of the, of the table or the database is always going to be consistent. And so if you crash, you just throw, if you crash and restart, you just throw away the things that shadow copy that never got updated. And the last one is the log structured approach, 
Um, and this is where the, the log essentially is the table heap. Um, and you depend all the entries for, for the changes that you make. And this is, this is the same architecture that's used in LevelDB and RocksDB. So I'll also say too for this evaluation, since we only wanted to look at storage and recovery mechanisms, we're going to run this, all of these in the same HStore style concurrent call scheme where you have a single threaded execution engine that can only one, run one transaction at a time at that partition and you have to acquire the lock for that partition so that you know, before you're allowed to run and you know nobody else is running so you don't need low level latches on the, any data structures. So this is really looking at how if you architect the system how this will be affected by MVM and not worrying about any other sort of high level constructs like concurrent control in, in the architecture. All right, so let's go through each of these and we'll see first what the sort of the textbook or canonical version looks like and then we'll see how we can improve them by being cognizant that we have non-volatile memory and that we can do reads and writes to memory that we knew writes to memory that end up being persistent. So in the sort of standard in-place updates engine, what happens is that when you want to modify this particular tuple, the first thing you have to do is put the, uh, the delta or the physical change that you made to that tuple out into a write-ahead log then you actually apply the change to the, the tuple in, in the table heap. And then eventually, some later point, you'll write out a snapshot to say that this is the, you know, this is the version of, of the tuple uh, at a particular point in time. And so for this, you see that we're essentially doing three writes into memory to do one update. Right? Because we have to ac account for the fact that this thing, you know, in, in, in the original design of this architecture, that this table heap was, was assumed to be volatile. All right, it's actually even worse in other systems like MySQL because MySQL actually will do four writes because they have a double write back buffer that they stage the writes first before they get written out uh, before you flush pages in, in the snapshot. Right, so the problem here is we have two duplicate data because again we're doing three writes for one update and then it's going to make our recovery latency really be really slow because we have to replay the write ahead log and apply all the changes and put it back into, into memory. Even though when you think about it, right, if I if I knew this transaction was, was committed and I did my update here, when I crash come back, this memory is actually still going to be available. But because if I, if, I, if I treat this as volatile memory, then I have to load the old snapshot. If I know that it's non-volatile, then I can come back and as long as I'm careful about uh, how, what, what changes are actually visible, this is actually would be the, the, the correct version of the database. And I don't need to load the log or load the, the snapshot. So this is what I mean by an example of trying to be smart about how we, uh, how we use non-volatile memory. So what we're going to do now is we're going to leverage the fact that the allocator is going to be able to generate non-volatile pointers for us. So that means that the only thing we need to record now in our log is the pointer to the thing that changed rather than the, the, the data that was changed, rather than the delta record. And so then the only thing we have to now maintain is, is, is a, this undo log that where we keep track of anything that, um, again, we keep track of the old versions of, of tuples in this transient log, and then when a transaction, if a transaction aborts, we know how to roll them back. Um, but then we can throw that away when the transaction commits. But then as we do this, we, do, we never need to do the redo log and the, the, the write ahead log, because when a transaction finishes, we'll flush all the changes out in our CPU caches from the table heap, we'll make sure they get written out to, to NVM. And because we have now a log that says, here's the pointers to the things that got modified, when we come back, we just make sure that the, um, that the pointers reflect the changes from transactions that actually committed. So if you have a pointer that points to something that was modified by a transaction that didn't finish, you can go, get, uh, you can go ahead and un undo it. So for this, again, now, we see that we're going to have an MVM table heap and MVM storage. No longer we, we don't need the snapshots anymore. So when we update this tuple 1 here, all we have to do in our write ahead log is flush out that here's the pointer to the tuple that got modified. Um, and then we can go ahead and modify the tuple. And so as long as this thing makes it first before this, then we know it's safe for us to write this out. We won't lose any changes. So now we only, we only have to do two writes instead of three writes. Uh, or even four writes for doing these in-place updates because we're using MVM correctly. All right, so now copy and write. Again, this is just shadow paging from the intro class, right? How it normally work is that say you have these, this, you organize this as a tree structure 
And then the, the leaf nodes in the tree are pointing to slotted pages, just like as before we discussed in the, in the second lecture. Um, so now when I want to do an update to one tuple in this, in this page, I have to copy the whole, uh, the whole page over, right, and then apply my change there. Then I create this dirty directory that now can point to the unmodified leaf and the updated leaf. And then I have to do a flip and flip to my master record and now point to this dirty record when the, when the transaction commits. So the big bottleneck here, the big, the big issue with this approach in NVM is copying this slot of page or to, over to the, to, to the shadow copy, the dirty directory. Right, because if I'm organizing this as a four kilobyte block and I'm only updating one tuple, I'm, all, you know, I'm copying four kilobytes just to copy things over. All right? And again, that'll, that'll wear down the device if you're doing this you know, over and over again. So, so we have expensive copies uh, and we want to get rid of that. So now what we're going to do is that instead of having the uh, organizing the, the, the tuples in these slotted pages, we'll just have actually pointers to the tuples in, in, just in memory. So now it's more fine-grained so that when we want to update a single tuple, we only have to just copy over the, the, the new versions and we don't only have to modify the pointer to that new version. So then we just go ahead and flip through and modify now these pointers. So we're always going to have to create this new version because you always have to create the new tuple, but you don't have to copy the entire page when you do this. And then now you're just moving around 64-bit pointers to update the dirty directory. So the main benefit you're getting here is, is removing having to copy the, that entire page. Um, yes? Each leaf only contains one tuple. What's that? Um, uh, each leaf has only one tuple. No, I mean, so there would be... Um, for this architecture, I think the leaves can have multiple tuples. Um, for this diagram, it's just one. Yeah. But even then, you're only updating single, single pointers. All right, so the last one is the log structured engine, which again is from, from LevelDB or RocksDB. And then this one, you have this in-memory uh, mem table, which is, I think, is organized as a skip list. And then you have the write-ahead log where you're going to append all your changes to uh, that things get modified. And then over time, you'll move everything out to an SS table where there's a bloom filter and then sort of, uh, uh, I don't think there's usually an index on top of this. They're usually just, just sorted, uh, sorted heap. So when I want to modify a tuple, I have to then apply a change, or append a change to my, my write-ahead log with the delta. And then eventually this will get flushed out to, the, to an SS table and where we go ahead and write it again. So now when you think about this, in, again, for non-volatile memory, this whole mem table doesn't need to be, this whole mem table is going to be persistent. The whole idea in, in a log structured merge tree is that this thing sits in volatile memory and these things are immutable out on disk. But now if this thing is actually persistent itself, you can just get rid of this, the this thing entirely, and then you don't have to duplicate any more data, and you don't have to do any more compactions, right? So essentially what you just do is just throw this thing away, and then now you only have the mem table. And you can make different, uh, you know, when the mem table gets filled up, you just, you know, copy it on the side and start a new one, but you don't need to sort of do compaction or, or reorganize it as, as an SS table. It's sort of, how it sits in memory like this is how it's going to be persisted going forward. This, so this reduces all the, arc, the overhead you have of, of copying things down to different levels. All right, so the high level main takeaways about what I've just showed you is that we're going to use the fact that we have uh, persistent memory that's actually byte addressable to avoid having to do extra data duplication or extra writes to, to either write-head log or snapshots or an SS table for all these different architectures. And then the other key thing about it is that by now only recording pointers to things got, that got modified, when we crash and come back, we just have to make sure that uh, our pointers actually should, should, should actually be there or not, right? based on whether the transaction committed. And we can, we can use our non-volatile memory pointers to build these non-volatile data structures that we guarantee that the internal architecture of these systems, these components, will be consistent after, after we restart. All right, so real to finish up, we'll go through a quick evaluation that shows that uh, the, the benefit you can get from this, having this architecture. And as I said before, we don't want to measure, we don't want to have concurrency be a bottleneck at all for anything in, in our measurements. So we're going to use the HDOR style concurrency control that doesn't have any low level latches that can interfere. And for this, again, since non-volatile memory doesn't actually exist yet, 
the way we're going to run all this is actually through a hardware em emulator that uh, Intel Labs provided us where you, we, you can tweak things to actually have DRAM get slowed down as if it was actually NVM. So that, again, it, it's still all DRAM, but the way it works is they put extra sort of debug code in, or they, they put extra code inside the, or microcode, inside the debug hooks for the motherboard so that when you do a read and write on one socket to DRAM, uh, it, uh, there's a little busy loop that'll spin for a bit and slow down your loads and stores. And so you can go now into the kernel and you can actually specify what you want the latency, uh, the slowdown to be. So again, it's still, still just DRAM. You pull the plug, everything gets, 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 uh, gets blown away. But it, this, this is sort of the best approximation of what MVM actually would look like that I think is much better than any, any of the other papers that are out there. Um, a lot of other people do sort of simulations or they run things in PIN where they sort of slow things down. Uh, uh, this is actually nice because you just take your binary that you write in your laptop and you can run it on this emulator and not have to change anything. It just, just works as if it, as if it had a DRAM. And so for this, we're using, we use YCSB and a moderate size, or a rather small size database system, but we'll do 10% reads and 9% writes with high, high skew. And the idea here is that we're, we're, we're doing heavy writes because that's where you'll see the major benefit of these architecture, uh, of the optimized architectures for NVM versus sort of the canonical implementation. All right, so the first one, we can just, we're just gonna measure what the actual runtime performance of, of these, uh, of, of, the, of the architectures. And so here again, we have in the gray bars, we're gonna have the traditional ones to the textbook implementations, and then the uh, red ones are the, the NVM optimized one. So when we first started this project, we thought that we could maybe make the copy and write architecture work the best. Because we had this sort of uh, fanciful notion that, that we were gonna take, you know, shadow paging from IBM from the 1970s, and if we tweaked it very carefully and, we were, and used, you know, MVM correctly, we could actually make 1970s, you know, ideas or concepts perform really well on, you know, 2015, 2016 hardware. It didn't turn out to be the case at all. And it's sort of obvious in retrospect that the in-place updates was always going to be the fastest for this, right? Because you just, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to prepare anything when transactions commit. You don't have to switch any pointers. You just do all your updates uh, directly on the data that, that you want to modify. So again, across the board, you see that the, 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 the MM optimized ones are always doing much better. You see a better, the most benefit coming from the copy and write case, but it's never going to be as good as, as the in-place updates, which is always going to be faster. And then the last one, we, the, the next measure we can say is how many store operations are we actually going to do to the storage device? So again, this is important for wear down. If you have your, um, if you have your database system writing to, to the actual storage medium too much, you'll wear it out uh, uh, quickly over time. And so part of the reason why you see the better performance for the in-place updates engine on the last slide is because simply it's just doing much fewer writes than, than, than these other ones. Right, because you don't have to prepare copies of things, you just write directly to the data that you need. Right, so here you see that uh, you get the most reduction for the in-place updates, but the other ones are dropped down uh, 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 pretty, well as, uh, pretty well as well. Okay, so now the last experiment we're gonna do is to measure what actually the recovery time is for the database system. And the idea here is that because now we're storing pointers, Instead of, actual, uh, instead of actual data in our write-ahead log, when we recover, we just need to make sure that our pointers are actually valid and not go apply the changes back to, to, to the database as you would normally in, in write-ahead log recovery. So the first thing is that for copy and write, there's no recovery needed. The recovery is inst instantaneous because all you do is come back and just the master pointer for the ma master record points to the correct version of consistent snapshot of the database. Right, you don't you just throw away all, all the shadow copy there. So there's no, nothing to measure for recovery for, for these guys. But what, now what you see is for in the MVM optimized case, as you increase the number of transactions that you need to replay in your log, uh, for the traditional architectures, they get progressively slower. And this makes sense because you're replaying more in the log and you're, you're, you're applying more changes back into the database. But in the MVM case, you don't see that much big uh, performance difference at all because the cost of going and checking to see whether your pointers are valid is actually re really, really small. So that's why you don't see uh, these guys have stepping up as much as, as the traditional ones. 
Yes. But, uh, but I still keep uh, undo log the inputs out there. So as you have more transaction, you have more undo log to re reply. The statement is that uh, you have to maintain the undo log for, for in-place updates. Then as you add more transactions, you have to more to undo. No, because so like undo log is only necessary when the, uh, if the transaction never committed before you crash. In the, so, so you would see the commit message and make sure you do, if you get the order correctly, you see the commit message and therefore you know anything that comes before the, in your right-hand log for that transaction, all those pointers will be valid. So you don't have to undo anything. That, that just gets thrown away. Right? So that's why, again, you don't, you don't you know, when we say recovery, I don't mean like, uh, you, know, here's, you know, here's a thousand transactions that all did not commit correctly. Let me abort them. It's like, how, how, how many transactions do I have to look at my log to guarantee and to make sure that they, they're, they're correct? Right? Okay, so... Uh, what are my parting thoughts about this? Um, again, I think that our study shows, and in later papers that we've had, shows that if you're going to have to use, you have to redesign your data system to use MVM correctly um, in order to get the, the better performance and reduce the wear down. If you just take, uh, if you just take MySQL and just run it on MVM, it actually doesn't perform well. We have a previous paper, earlier paper, that shows this, that like, if you just take HStore on, and MySQL, and you run them on non volatile memory, they more or less become the same, right? But they're still not, not as good as you can get for the optimized ver versions that we showed here. And it's only when the, the byte addressable MVM comes out, supposedly in 2018, um, I can talk, talk offline more about that if you want. When that comes out, I think that's gonna be a big deal and that's gonna require all the database companies to rethink about how they're gonna th design their system. And supposedly this MVM stuff is, is going to be much cheaper than, than sort of the early NAND flash that came out. Uh, I don't know whether that's true. The Memristor guys were talking about you know, petabytes on a square centimeter. Of course, that obviously never panned out. Uh, but I, I, you know, if you look at the new Intel Optane devices that came out, they're like $1,000 or $2,000 and not that expensive. right? And so I think that this, if this bidirectional MVM is actually cheap, and fast enough, uh, it could be a big, big deal. Okay? All right, any questions? All right, so we'll, fi we'll finish up. This is the last lecture. Um, on Monday's class, or sorry, Tuesday's class, uh, I'll start off the first like five or 10 minutes to give like a high level overview or, or what's, which, which should be expected on the uh, final exam. If you came in late, there was passed around copies of the, the Sable final exam that were handed out. Um, there'll be two copies, one is with the solutions, one without. We're also having Marcel Karnacker come on Tuesday to give a guest lecture on Cloudera Impala and Kudu. Um, Cloudera, uh, Marcel was uh, Mike Sternbreaker's PhD student at Berkeley in the, in the 2000s. Uh, he worked on Google F1, uh, and then he later left that to go build that sort of same, similar, something similar at Cloudera called Impala. Um, I think that's everything I wanted to cover. Right, and then the exam will be Thursday next week. Okay? Any questions? Oh, real quick. Yeah, now I remembered. Uh, please fill out the faculty course evaluation. Uh, that's actually really important. I realized that when I was in school and I never took it seriously. Uh, <laughs> no, it's really important because I, I, like, the feedback you guys provide me uh, is actually very helpful to decide you know, whether the, you know, the reading reviews are the right amount, whether the lectures made sense whether you wanted more of something else or less of something else. And I actually do take that consideration and, and actually help me uh, to make the course better. If you don't like my hygiene, just put, put, you, know, put, you put that in there too, I don't care. <laughs> Be brutal, right? I, I actually do read them and actually do take them seriously, okay? And I, I will pester people until we get the, the you know, 100% uh, fill, them filled out. I don't, have they sent you the email about this or no? Yeah, they put it. Okay, yeah, so please do it, okay? All right, uh, it's been an awesome class, and I'll see you guys on uh, Tuesday.